Hi, everyone. I um, want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone uh, to our monthly implementation board. I now call this meeting of the KCRJ implementation board to order. Uh, we will start by grounding our work in the theory of change, which is if we create a homeless response system that centers people with lived experience, then we will be able to focus on responding to needs and eliminating inequities in order to end homelessness for all. This is a hybrid meeting as all of our meetings will be moving forward. So there is a physical location as well as virtual access. Um, there are people in person at the University of Seattle Public Library. Really thank everyone that went out to keep Austin company. Um, he has often been alone. So that's good that he has people there with him. Um, and now I will turn it to Austin to take role. The student, my final promotions to panelists here. Jaja, I see you. Um, and awesome, sweet. Uh, Member Anderson? Member Caminos? Member Carvalho? Here. Member Shelmanac? Here. Member Merritts? Member McHenry Jr. Member Pat now. Here. Member Brandon. Member Reddy. Member Floyd. Member Floyd. See, I see Member Floyd there. I'll come back, just re-promote that panelist. And Member Ross. Present. And I see alternative. Uh, for Charlie, are you filling in for uh, Brandon today? Uh, I'm here. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, Chair, we are. Um, missing one from quorum but Daja Floyd uh is having some technical difficulties so eventually once we get to the vote we should have quorum in theory um so we will work with Jaja um to get that situated um with that I give it back to you awesome um I want to move us on to the land acknowledgement we acknowledge that King County is located on the unceded traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples we honor this land and its people past and present, and we are committed to directing and funding and resourcing to organizations led by and in support of native and indigenous people. Um, we will also be having public comment today. Uh, public comment will be for only 15 minutes following the CEO update. Each member of the public gets one minute. If you are in Zoom, please raise your hand now and our clerk Austin will call on you in the order it is received. If you are in person, please connect with Austin to sign up and to get your name on the list. Uh, the next part, uh, before we go to CEO updates, let's move on to our consent agenda. This month, we, have two, we had two meetings to approve our regular September meeting and in a special meeting. Is there a motion to approve our consent agenda? So moved. Or is there a second? Second. All right. All those who approve, say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. 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 Any opposed? Do we have to wait till we have? Yeah, um, I was going to say, actually, Austin, we don't have quorum yet, right? Are we yeah, we don't have Georgia? quorum. Uh, yeah, we don't have quorum yet, so we'll re we could reconsider this later. Um, still working on the Georgia. It seems like it's technical difficulty, so we're working that out right now. But okay. uh, yeah, if you want to move over to public comment, we can. Uh, well, we're actually going to move on to um, CEO Helen Howell for an update, and then we will open up public comment. So again, please raise your hand, um, and Austin will call you in that order after CEO updates, or if you're in person, sign up with Austin. All right, I'm going to pass it to you, Helen. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Nice to see all of you. Welcome to the last meeting of 2023 at the IB. Uh, today, we're going to be sharing a presentation on our 2024 budget, as well as a short summary of program outcomes for the last year. 
I want to thank all of you for your support over the course of this year and through this time of transition. Uh, we approved a five-year plan together. We're improving agency operations together, and we're building a more regional approach. Um, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, before we get started, I would uh, like to give a quick update on the CEO search. I understand that the search firm is finalizing the job description. We expect them to post it in early January. And uh, their goal is to have a slate of candidates to present to the CEO search advisory committee in March. Also want to give you an update on Medicaid billing. As you know, under Washington's foundational community supports program, housing navigation and housing stability services can be billed to Medicaid. So uh, the authority is working to maximize Medicaid as an additional revenue source for support, supportive services within the homeless crisis response system. The process is somewhat complicated, but after several months, our housing navigation and stability staff have been through the required orientations and trainings and have finalized the required policies and tech uh, configurations. We've also received our first approvals and denials from Medicaid, and so we're continuing to train staff on the required documentation. Finally, I'd note that we're also working with the state healthcare authority and our federal partners at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness to explore what waivers and process improvements might be implemented uh, within the system to help uh, streamline the process. One thing I, did someone have comment, question? Okay, one thing also I would like to note here um, is with regard to the 231 individuals housed through the Partnership for Zero initiative, um, they do continue to be supported. There were some comments and questions raised at, during the public comment at the last IB meeting, questioning whether that was the case. And so I just note that those in permanent supportive housing have housing and service support through that program. And the 150 clients in private market housing have rental assistance guaranteed up to, six, to 18 months rather which will allow time for KCRHA staff to work with them to find stability where they are or secure other housing off, uh, options that can be long-term. Looking forward into 2024, we have a number of major initiatives coming up. I wanna start by thanking Governor Inslee for his support on the state right of way encampment resolutions and his push to continue this work in 2024. I'm hopeful that the state legislature will again make significant investments in housing and homelessness prevention uh, to build on the historic investments they made last year. Similarly, I'm excited to see the implementation plans for the King County Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services Levy, as well as the plans for the Seattle Housing Levy. Um, the passage of both um, show that local voters are prioritizing resources for housing and homelessness. More immediately, we have the point in time count and a housing inventory count coming up at the end of January. Um, also, much of next year is going to be spent working with our nonprofit partners in outreach, shelter, and supportive services as we prepare to kind of redesign, uh, re-procure the system with new uh, service contracts to implement the five-year plan. Also, a big part of our job moving forward is to make sure that the next CEO has what they need to be an effective leader for the agency. And um, with that, those are the updates that I have for you right now. I'm looking forward to meeting with you again in January to approve the 2024 budget. Awesome. Thank you, um, Helen. Are there any questions before we move on with the rest of the agenda? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Gordon has joined, just in case you didn't know, Paula. Oh, awesome. Good seeing you, Gordon. And Jaja also joined. So we knew we do now have quorum. Yep. Sorry Perfect. about my noise. Nope. All good. Austin, do you think we should um, vote on the uh, consent agenda or should we move forward with the updates? Um, I'm sorry, not updates. I would say let's just do the consent agenda since it has two months. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. So we are going to um, take a vote on the consent agenda for October and November's meetings. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Okay, I saw Christopher. Um, Sorry, there... Adam, so moved. Sorry. And awesome. I second it, Paula. Awesome. Is there, um, so all who approve say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So our October and November consent agendas are, uh, are passed. Um, and now we are going to, Austin, I'm going to toss it to you. We're going to now do public comment, which will be for 15 minutes. Um, if you have your hand raised, Austin has put you in the queue to speak, as well as those who are physically uh, in place right now. Um, Austin, would you please open public comment and call on folks in that order? Yes. Um, perfect. Thank you, Taj, for the timer, as always. So remember, for, reminder for everybody with public comment, uh, it is set at one minute. Um, if you are in person, uh, just speak. The camera will focus on you. I recommend talking into the top here so it doesn't look as awkward. Um, and we will begin here at the people at the university branch at the Seattle Public Library. First up I have is Alicia Burton. Is that correct? Awesome. Your one minute will start as soon as you speak and um, you can begin. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Burton and I am with Nicholsville Central District. There was an urgency from the RHA and HSD. They kept delaying us. We asked HSD in February. In May, they said they have a list of sites for us, but we have to deal with the RHA. We didn't get the list until late November. Meanwhile, from January to October, there has been 300 plus deaths of homeless people in King County alone. We want to know if this delay has been a deliberate attempt to avoid the current house issues with the tiny house villages. Awesome. Thank you, Alicia. Um, next up we have is um, Kyle. Well, Kinchelo. Kinchelo, awesome. And then uh, if you are done speaking, if you want to say, I yield my time, just so we know. Uh, no, yeah. um, I, my name is Kyle. I, uh, I'm with Central District, Nicholsville uh, Tiny House. Uh, so I guess uh, there's, um, you guys got some uh, contracts coming that are getting voided next year and we stuff with the providers. Uh, and, and, and with that, there's like some 90 day uh, and you can't, you got to move out after 90 day kind of a thing that are, from my understanding, and and that's kind of concerning because I, I don't know how anybody could really go uh, go from the streets to a, a new a new life in ninety days, and it just doesn't seem like that's kind of it doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, like I know there's people I know that would have money that could support themselves, and they couldn't do a new life in ninety days. So uh, I, I just that's that's kind of all I wanted to say is that this ninety day thing is kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. So. Yep. yep, perfect. Thank you, Kyle. Um, next up is um, Peggy Hotes. Hotes. Totes. Yes. Totes. Yes. Thank Peggy, you. I'll, if you want uh, your one minute starts as soon as you talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'll dovetail a little bit on what Kyle said. Uh, but first of all, yes, I am Peggy Hotes, and I'm one of the many Nicholsville founders. We were founded back in 2008. Uh, so, the, so to dovetail on Kyle's comments, the reason why 90 day stays at any of the shelters or tiny house villages do not make sense is because we all know the elephant in the living room. There is no place for people to go. If they had a place to go, they would go there. Um, also dovetailing again on Alicia's statements, and this happened prior to us contacting interim director Howell, by the way. So I wanna make that clear. The dysfunctionality that we faced in trying to create a tiny house village. And we kept saying, are they doing this intentionally? Because 
we, we went in in February to meet with HSD and it wasn't until May that we were told that they had a list of properties that we might start a tiny house village on. We had the experience, we had the money, uh, we're ready to go. And in this time of great need, why couldn't we do that? It wasn't until November, this November, Peggy, that we finally got the list. Your one minute. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, next up we have is Kia Du. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, my name is Kia Du and I'm from Nicholsville in the Central District. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, the bureaucracies of um, trying to get help. It just seems like it's really set up for it to not, to, to be impossible to get help. It, it feels like you have to do all this stuff and really it feels like, you know, people just need help really um, getting housing. Why make it difficult, you know? So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, if you had more to say, you could share some of my time if you had more to say. Okay, this is Peggy again, and I'll say that there is a candlelight vigil for the over 300 people who died outside through violence or in a public wet, uh, place in King County. Uh, it's on the steps of City Hall. It's December 21st. It starts at 5 p.m. It's a lovely candlelight vigil. I hope you'll join. Thank you, Peggy. And Kia, yeah. um, is there anyone else at, here at the University Branch Library at Seattle Public Library, Law Libraries, want to speak? No? Awesome. We will move over to Zoom. So sorry for the library, I have to use the computer um, for a bit. Um, and next up we have is Bill Curlin Hackett. Bill, you've been given permission to speak. If you want to uh, test your mic first and then your one minute will start after that. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bill. Thank you. Um, I sent uh, a public testimony to Austin because I had more to say than it would fit into this time. And by the way, the governing committee, Dow Constantine, at their last meeting said, Public comment should last more than one meet, one minute. So I, I insist that you concur with the governing committee and look at longer than one minute testimony. It's just inadequate. The thing I really want to ask today is why do we not have access to an org chart on KCRHA? When this was being considered and presented by uh, prior, prior to being executive Dones, um, there were org charts in all the design. Uh, so we could all see the flow. We don't know who's who. I don't care if we don't have all their contact info. I don't want them harassed. But I think there should be an org chart on the web page so we know what the structure looks like, all the way from our vehicle residency work group all the way to the top. Because right now, we're playing in the dark, and we just don't know who's who. So please consider that. If you have to take it to the governing committee, then do that. So thanks. Have a good holiday, all of you. Thank you, Bill. Next up we have is Jade. Jade, I've given you permission to speak if you want to test your mic really quick, and then your one minute will start after you test. Hello? Yes. Hi, Jade. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay. I've been working and living in King County for seven years, and I'm currently facing eviction and a dramatic increase in King County D1. This is particularly triggering for me during the winter because some of my most traumatic childhood moments occurred during the cold and holiday season while surviving an uninhabitable shelter with zero utilities and below freezing temperatures. Therefore, I can only imagine the severity of the brutal suffering our neighbors living outside are enduring as I speak. What I do know, though, is that it is deeply inhumane for anyone to have to navigate living on shelter or without basic needs, especially during the heart of winter. While I appreciate the RHA's move in announcing the King County funding for $5 million towards severe weather response shelters in South King County, the reality is that's simply not enough. The RHA's response to severe weather in North King County is frail at best. This disparity is unacceptable. Not only are our unhoused neighbors in North King County in immediate need, there's also many families and individuals seeking basic needs such as warm heating and showers due to issues like rolling power outages. We are tired of hearing excuses. We're tired of pacifying your boards as our community continues to be harmed by negligent you, public policy. Thank you, Jake. Your one minute has expired. Um, last on the Zoom link is Michelle Eastman. Michelle, you've been given uh, permission to speak. If you want to unmute, test your mic, your one minute will start after that. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Michelle. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hello, my name is Michelle Eastman. I'm the Director of Communications for the Washington State Lived Experience Coalition. I wanna remind the KCRHA that over 300 people died outside in King County 
this past year. And I hope that the KCRHA will use this number as a reminder and continue to increase inclement weather, shelter, and services throughout King County. There currently is not enough shelter at this moment. I'm thinking of in North King County where I live. Additionally, I lean into the KCRHA to create a greater response to wet weather. Even though King County receives a lot of rain, it's still dangerous. The dampness can lead to illness and death. Having strong El Nino will mean more rain and more chances of flooding and create the likelihood that more unhoused community members are going to experience the consequences. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Michelle. With that, I will ask one more time um, for anyone in Zoom to raise their hand if you want to give public comment, as well here as the university branch. No? No? Chair, I give it back to you. Public comment is now closed. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Bill, for raising what the governing committee is doing. I think in the new year, we can, the implementation board, um, can revisit the one minute vote that we took several months ago. Um, but yeah, until then, uh, I want to just kind of keep to what the whole board agreed upon. Um, and now I want to pass it on to uh, Helen and Owen, who are going to give us a 2023 annual report. Um, and so yeah, Helen and Owen, please take it away. Okay. Um, so I think that the title annual report makes it sound a little bigger than it is. It's really um, uh, sharing some of the uh, program outcomes over the last year, third quarter last year through third quarter of uh, this year. Um, so, uh, just to repeat myself a little, you know that I've been focusing on internal ops, trying to fix gaps and strengthen the agency in advance of a new CEO. Um, this work has included some program review changes that we've implemented in response to recent audits. Uh, we're still working to streamline processes around contracts and fiscal operations, putting more of an emphasis on uh, customer service, um, seeking feedback from service providers, government uh, partners. Uh, we believe that improving these internal functions will help refocus the agency back on our founding mission of unifying and coordinating homelessness response. Um, next slide. I actually can't see this slide, so uh, there we go. Next one. Sorry. Hey, okay. sorry. Helen, sorry. The slides weren't showing, at least for me, Gordon. Can you just go back? Sure. Okay. So when oh, I was talking, like, yeah. I was talking about internal operations. Okay. This is the first uh, substantive okay. slide, and Great. just focusing on the core. And I kind of walked through some of the things in this visual internal processes, responding to audit results, focusing more on customer service, really taking a look at uh, fiscal operations, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the slide for uh, my first set of uh, comments. So Thank next, you, uh -huh, no problem. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of the right of way encampment resolutions, again, I just want to thank Governor Inslee for uh, his leadership together with uh, PDA, uh, REACH, WASDOT, State Patrol and the Department of Commerce, we've successfully moved 335 people off state highways and into shelter and housing. Uh, in this work, PDA and REACH have an 89% acceptance rate for the housing and services offered. Uh, so the vast majority of people are moving inside to a place that works for them. Uh, the key is usually uh, the taking of time, often several weeks for meaningful outreach, and then making sure that we offer the right resources to match what people need. We're uh, at this point primarily relying on master lease department buildings, uh, non-congregate emergency housing, and some tiny homes. All of these come with staff and supportive services to help people uh, stabilize. And it's due to the significant investment by the state um, that that's why this work is successful. 
It's also a great example of effective collaboration across agencies and levels of government, and we're looking forward to continuing this work in 2024. Next slide, please. Um, also, I'd just like to highlight the work of the Ombuds Office, which is now fully staffed. So we're uh, excited about that. It's taken a long time. Uh, it's one of the key ways that we continue to center lived experience. Their team of five talks to people with lived experience every day that are interacting with the system and bring feedback um, to our work to improve the overall crisis response system. You can see from the slide uh, the number of inquiries that has increased significantly over the last year and the types of responses that the team is providing. I'd also encourage you to take a look at our recent blog post. It's a Q&A with Chief Ombuds, Katara Jordan, where she talks a lot more about uh, this work. And with that, I will uh, pass it over to Owen to speak to uh, some of our program outcomes. Thank you, Helen. Um, hey, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Owen Capus. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm our Chief Community Impact Officer at the RHA. Um, like Helen said, today I'm not going to walk you through a full year in review in terms of the outcomes from our programs into homeless services locally, um, largely because we are still in the year of 2023. Um, but instead, I'm going to walk you through a couple key areas for outcomes for the first three quarters of the year. So it's going to be really focused in on January 1 to September 30th of 2023, with a bit of a comparison to the same time period in 2022. A key piece in this that I want to lift up to is this program level, not system level piece. Um, right now, what we're looking at within the, these breakdowns um, that I'll show you in a moment is how uh, individual enrollments are ending or working within a program. So in each of our programs, um, somebody or a household has an enrollment that starts and an enrollment end date. Um, we're going to be looking at really those as individual pieces in this analysis, because when there's that end date is when we know somebody's exiting the permanent housing or to maybe another uh, destination. My team is working on something bigger to get to that system level approach so that we're able to see how many different enrollments work together for households. But as we are working towards that um, in one of our larger initiatives, this is what we're going to look at today. Um, just wanted to make sure that we had that distinction. Um, and uh, one other distinction is that uh, we are going to look at some uh, beds in this, and that is from the housing inventory counts over the years. Um, and then our program outcomes are really going to be straight from H minus. One thing, though, that I do always want to ground us in, and I, you may, you will continue to see me with this slide at almost every time I appear, um, but really grounding us in the scale of the problem. Uh, the work that we did in our five-year plan, um, working with Cloudburst and working with the state, indicated that in 2022, 53,532 people experienced homelessness in King County. That's a number that is far larger than what we have we have used previously, and it's really important to me that we continue to put this out as the truth, the, uh, the best truth that we have that is, and what we're holding ourselves, our, our agency, and our community accountable to. You'll notice immediately a pretty stark contrast between that number and the number of uh, available or availabilities within our system, <laughs> excuse me. What you have in front of you here is a breakdown of uh, beds available at the housing inventory count from 2018 through 2023 for five different program types, emergency shelter, transitional housing, refugee housing, other permanent housing, and permanent supportive housing. Um, again, as you can see, these numbers where we're talking emergency housing is about 5,300 uh, emergency shelter units in 2023, that is, uh, uh, 10 times fewer emergency shelter units than we do have for people who experienced homelessness around that similar time. So we are not scaled to, the, to uh, solve this problem. Um, yet we are making some progress in terms of adding uh, uh, resources to our system. Uh, one thing that I will point out with our emergency shelter system is this very clear dip we saw in 2021 
um, when we were moving towards uh, de-intensification for COVID-19, we had to shut some shelter beds down in the system. It was not safe to have people as close together as we were having in many of our congregate shelters. But coming back into 2022 and 2023, we raised that amount back up. We were able to create more non-congregate shelters for safe places for folks to be. Um, and that is one of the areas that we are going to continue to look at as an agency is how do we increase the capacity of non-congregate shelters where people um, can go and are desirable places for folks to come inside. Uh, a couple other trends I'll hit on here real quick. Transitional housing, uh, you can see that going down year after year. Just a reminder for folks that uh, we locally and nationally have been transitioning away from transitional housing as a main source of getting folks on a pathway to housing. Um, and instead focusing on housing first practices, uh, similar to RAP3 housing, so that we're getting somebody into a unit that they can stabilize and stay in, that that can be their permanent housing. Uh, other permanent housing, that big jump is our emergency housing voucher program, uh, where we very successfully locally were able to get a large number of folks directly into housing using those new grants that came from COVID. And then PSH, we do see the steady growth over time. But one of the things I do want to point out with uh, permanent supportive housing is that just because we show that we have 7,300 permanent house or permanent supportive housing units of, it, or of inventory in 2023, it does not mean that that number of units are available for people to move into. Most of those are full and will be con continue to be full. The main way we actually get available units in PSH is new construction or new units coming online. We'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, lower down what transition through that looks like, um, but just want to make it really clear to folks that those those units do not equate to bringing uh, 7,000 folks from that 53,000 we talked about just a moment ago inside permanently. So that's our system capacity. Um, want to move into some outcomes and we'll give some brief definitions for this. In the following slides, you're going to see things about unique household served. So this is looking at a unique count of total households that were enrolled in a program, even if it is just one day in the period we're talking about. Um, so that could be a household that uh, has been in um, multiple shelter programs over the course of a year. They would really just be counted once as being served at, a single, at least once during a reporting year. We're going to look at exit to permanent housing. I talked about this just a little bit, but every enrollment that we have in a program has an exit date. Um, and on that exit date, we collect the destination type. Uh, permanent housing is one of those. Um, and so we are looking at the number of times households exit to permanent housing. Because of that, a single household may have multiple exits over the course of a year and would be counted multiple times. Exit rate to permanent housing is just a uh, simple math. How many, folk, how many exits to permanent housing were there over total exits? Um, looking to see basically what percent of exits were successful. Uh, we're going to look at length of stay. It's looking at the number of days a household has been enrolled in a program. We'll look at that for overall enrollments and then also look at it for those that ended in uh, permanent housing. And then uh, return rates. We want to, of course, make sure that when people exit to permanent housing, they're able to maintain that. But there is a percent of households that have previously exited to PH that end up enrolling into a homeless program again that indicates literal homelessness, so returning to homelessness. Sorry about being really like a little bit technical about those, but it's important for me that folks have that framing before jumping into this. So emergency shelter. This is one of the ones that we talk about most often. Just want to be clear with folks that this emergency shelter uh, is inclusive of tiny home villages rather than separating those out as sometimes you see, um, because all of those are serving the same function of bringing people inside. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight on here, and I'm not going to read through every number, but the unique household served in Q3 um, in 2023 is an increase from what we saw in 2022. Mind you, I want to be really transparent. It's not a huge increase, but it is an increase. We are seeing small trends upward from this. Um, and we're seeing some similar outcomes throughout the other areas that we need to be uh, looking into uh, to figure out how we might be able to move those in the right direction. So you may immediately notice that access to permanent housing have um, a little over 100 fewer exits to permanent housing in Q3, Q3 of 2023 than in 2022. I want to be clear with folks, though, that with this just being a quarter review, that these are not final numbers for the year. When we do our final review of the year, we may find that those trends do or do not hold. I just wanted to make sure that you have this information in front of you. 
But these are the kind of pieces of information that we look at when we're considering what we might uh, look to do and rebid or how we uh, bid out new dollars coming into the shelter system to see how might we move the needle on any of these in the right direction. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have for emergency shelter there. Um, an additional part is transitional housing. I think this is something that's kind of interesting that I noticed in this is that um, even though we are seeing that decrease in the number of units of transitional housing in our system year after year, we did see more folks that were served and a very similar number of folks exiting to permanent housing in 2023 than we did in 2022. So it's going to be interesting to look into maybe why some of that is happening with our transitional housing programs. Um, and while I did say earlier that we are having some intentional disinvestments in transitional housing, both locally and nationally, there are um, a number of transitional housing programs that we do really want to continue to invest in because they are, are a really important part of our system. One of those areas is going to be for uh, youth and young adult. We have transitional housing programs for them. There are also special funding sources that can only be used on transitional housing. And so we will, uh, as a system, whether that be RHA or our partners uh, focused in veteran services, would continue to be looking at leveraging that funds so that people have a way to come inside um, and gain housing. One thing that's kind of interesting for me on this as well that jumps out is looking at the average length of stay for households that exit to permanent housing. We're seeing a, what looks like a pretty significant decrease from 2022 to 2023 in the number of days that folks are in a transitional housing program if they are exiting permanent housing. So that's an exciting thing to be seeing. That is something we do want to see decrease. Uh, rapid rehousing, we're seeing um, a total increase in the number of people who were served in that program from 2022 to 2023, but not yet seeing a, a huge difference in terms of the exits to permanent housing. Um, so that is something that we'll continue to monitor through this year. Uh, again, one of the exciting things seeing on this is the average length of time for households that exit to permanent housing has decreased significantly from 2022 to 2023. So that is something that tells me that when we're looking for how might we rebid services in the next year, let's narrow in on those components of rapid rehousing, seeing where we have programs that are doing really well in that length of stay and figure out what's working really well in those that we might be able to magnify across the system. And then the last category for me to share today is permanent supportive housing. Um, you might be looking at this and remembering that 7,300 number I, I mentioned earlier and saying, oh, there is only 5,600 that were served in, in uh, 2023, though. I uh, just want to use this as an opportunity to differentiate what we collect in the housing inventory count, which is a comprehensive count of all units of a certain type across the system, whether or not they participate in HMIS or whether or not we fund them. And then uh, these numbers, which are coming straight out of HMIS, so do require HMIS participation. Just want to let folks just drive that home so nobody is looking and doing this math uh, um, on the back of their napkin and wondering what's going on there. We do see a really high utilization of these um, and a really high number of uh, people who are either maintaining that housing or exiting to a permanent location, which is the goal of this program. So seeing that above 90% is something we regularly see year after year after year. Um, average length of stay in this uh, is intentionally long. So I just want to raise that for people again, that it's intentionally long. Um, and seeing that really low uh, rate of return to homelessness is something that we should expect to see in a program like this. And with that, I will pass it back to Helen to talk about our path forward. Thanks, Owen. Um, so as you all are aware, our five-year plan charts our long-term path. Um, it's our roadmap uh, for moving forward. The plan was based on deep uh, data analysis and community engagement, reflects the priorities uh, that have uh, potential to make a real difference. Again, wanna thank you for all your support and unanimous approval of the plan. And um, our overarching goal is to reduce unsheltered homelessness. And our thesis is that we need to make changes and look for progress at these three uh, levels that you see on the slide, uh, ensuring that every service provider has what they need to do the work well, that all service providers in our homelessness crisis response system are connected and coordinated, 
and that we're working across multiple systems, healthcare, housing, employment, education, and others to prevent homelessness. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the plan is clear and specific in the actions necessary to meet our goals. And we've prioritized these actions uh, for the first few years under current resources, current resource levels. Uh, with regard to these uh, actions, I would note that significant work is underway with our data and sub-regional planning teams to develop implementation plans specific to the seven sub-regions. Uh, we are continuing to work on improving our contracting process for the nonprofit service providers and to make sure that smaller and BIPOC serving organizations have access to technical assistance uh, throughout the process. As we uh, implement the plan, many of the uh, systems changes that are needed to move us closer to success will be articulated, as we've mentioned before, in the rebid process, the reprocurement of the uh, entire system and new uh, service contracts. We'll be starting that co-design work with service providers in early 2024. So I anticipate that we will actually talk a lot more uh, about that next year. And with that, I will just open it up to any Q&A or uh, comments, suggestions, recommendations, thoughts. Uh, well, since others are being quiet, um, the, the chart that showed the five year, and um, I know that, um, yeah, thank you, maximizing federal funding. You know, I know that there's been years, not RHA, but in the homeless work, years of wanting to leverage uh, Medicaid. And, and is this, um, I don't have a good way to characterize this question, Helen, but is this, um, uh, uh, aspirational or um, you know, like a critical critical strategy or tactic? I think it's probably uh, both in the sense that we're trying to learn as much as we can um, throughout this process of supporting uh, those housed through Partnership for Zero kind of as a pilot to, to educate ourselves about what's involved in seeking Medicaid uh, reimbursement through foundational community supports, um, but also learning so that we can think toward and look toward um, how to um, draw more revenue from Medicaid for the entire system and how we can support providers in doing that. Um, and we've also worked some with uh, uh, CSH along those lines as well, and are hoping to continue that work. Thank you. Marvin, Marvin I see that your hand is raised. Thank you. Um, uh, my question goes back to, uh, my question will be simple. Uh, Ending unsheltered homelessness was one of the prime directives of starting up the KCRHA. I am often confused at uh, when we talk about not ignoring one piece of the problem, which is there's not enough shelter. Uh, I guess my question is, how do we plan to expand existing systems and create more of the life-saving shelter that's needed uh, while housing is being procured? Well, I guess I would say that we operate within the constraints of the resources that we are awarded by the city and the county. And there is a certain amount of it that will be invested in uh, shelters, tiny homes, emergency housing, and those sorts of things. But as you're aware, Marvin, um, the resources within the system that we're working in are nowhere near the magnitude of the problem. So, um, it's difficult. Let's just put it that way. It's difficult. We will do the best we can with the resources that we do have, however. Thank you. Any other questions for Helen and Owen?
All right, we are going to move on. Um, thank you. Oh, Helen. Yeah, I was going to just introduce James, if that's okay, before the budget presentation. I just wanted to note that um, uh, James Rouse is our new interim CFO, and we're kind of lucky he's on board. He came to us after our prior interim CFO decided to pursue other opportunities, and so we're very fortunate that James uh, was available. He has strong experience in change management and a track record of successfully streamlining operations in a variety of contexts. So we are uh, pleased that he's with us. And also I just note that um, it's my belief that the new CEO likely will want to be the one to hire a permanent CFO. And I, it's my hope we can stick with James until we reach that point. So we're glad to have him on board. Uh, James will be joined by Tiffany Brooks, our Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. And so I'll hand it over to them. Uh, can I just can I just say right before um, James and Tiffany goes uh, that for the implementation board, we will be voting on our budget in January, uh, but I just want to remind you all that this is kind of, this is uh, while we hear the presentation and we'll vote in January, this is just kind of to approve the budget as is. Um, earlier in April, when Mark came to us and kind of explained what the budgeting process was, um, our approval of moving the budget forward was just to bring it up to the, gover the governing, uh, governing board um, and as well as give Mark the opportunity to advocate for more funding. So again, we will vote in January and we will have this presentation, but we're just kind of um, voting to accept the budget as is. There's kind of not a ton of advocacy work or um, pushing back on this budget. Sorry about that. So James, Tiffany, I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Again, I'm James Rouse. Thank, thank you, Helen, for that introduction. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I do come from a vast background of going into companies and streamlining operations and uh, doing some strategic planning and improving profitability, finding those efficiencies. I've done a lot of um, implementations of various systems, uh, ERP implementations, uh, Salesforce, those types of things, um, which is going to be critical to finding the efficiencies we need here at this organization to really improve um, our ability to report out um, on these numbers. So with that, um, Tiffany uh, is gonna join me in this presentation on the 2024 budget. Uh, Tiffany, you wanna share the slides? Great. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so the agenda here is that we're going through the 2023, um, but we're gonna show you the 2023 budget um, and then go into the 2024 budget and focus on the whole timeline and, and proposed budget and the final budget. Um, and then the actions needed there, as, as already described, it'll be happening in, in January for, for the adoption of the vote. Um, so the 2023 budget, just to remind everyone, these are the programs that um, we had and the budgets that were against them and they're at $228 million. Um, and that really kind of sets the tone for these, these same programs um, with maybe some additions, some slight variations are gonna continue in our 2024 budget. So the original proposed budget, um, and here's a really kind of, um, a really simple outline of the budget process, right? We start with a base budget. We we added some additional one-time funding um, and then additional incremental changes. Uh, on the next slide here, we have the timeline, um, which Paula had just kind of showed, but I just want to kind of repeat what really happened. In April, May, the budgets were submitted to, to all of you and to C City of Seattle and King County. In September 23, the Seattle mayor released budget revisions. Um, in October of 23, uh, King County released their revisions. Um, in November 23, the city of Seattle adopted the final budget. And in December 23, I think just last week, King County adopted the final budget. And so now we're here at this meeting to run through the budgets with you um, and then in January, we'll have a special meeting to um, adopt those budgets. 
So with that being said, Tiffany, do you wanna, I'm gonna let Tiffany really kind of do um, the presentation of this budget. She's the one that's closest to it, knows this stuff inside and out. She's been living it for the last year. Tiffany's incredible. So I'll let you Tiffany take over from here. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. So right now we're presenting our final budget for 2020, our originally proposed budget for 2024. And it's showing what we have proposed, similar to what Paula just said earlier, of what we um, anticipated to receive in funding, as well as any additional funds that we were anticipating to receive in 2024. As we get into our final budget, we want to highlight in the gray uh, cells with the little gray area, highlight what the difference is, the major shifts from our proposed budget to our final budget that we are offering and presenting to you guys now. And in the next slide, we'll identify what some of these major changes are, but we did want to highlight it for you so that you can see which programs and which fund sources are anticipated to have, or rather, which are having a difference in what we proposed in the spring versus what we are presenting now as our final budget. We just wanted to alleviate the stress of people having to flip back and forth between slides there to see what the other amounts were. Absolutely. In this side, we are doing that comparison a little bit more in detail between the proposed budget and our 2024 final budget. We want to highlight in the enhanced shelter line that there appears to be a difference, um, a decrease in funds, but there actually is not a decrease in enhanced shelter. We actually were doing a recategorization of our state right of way funding of $11.8 million from enhanced shelter services to permanent supportive housing services. Uh, we also are identifying a major increase in permanent supportive housing services. This is due to a decrease in our COC contracts that transition over, that will be transitioning over to us in 2024 and the um, inclusion of the state right of way that is coming from enhanced shelter and being recategorized as permanent supportive housing. We also are highlighting in safe parking that we have a council ad for RV storage program. And so that's increasing as well as the village's line code for Rosie's Village for an expansion and a move that they're doing. We also would like to highlight that there is a decrease in our admin budget due to the state right of way funding um, being decreased due to some of our underspend from 2023, I'm sorry, 2022, and for the transition in HIN and COC HUD programs transitioning to us in Q2 of 2024 instead of Q1. And then we are also highlighting the partnership for zero for the wind down and then the rental continued rental assistance for clients that are being currently being served by the partnership for zero into 2024 to ensure that they still have housing supports and supportive services. This is a slide just to compare our 2023 versus our 2024 budget. Uh, most of the major shifts are the same from the previous slide. Uh, I would just highlight again that the major change that you see in enhanced shelter is for the road being recategorized as permanent supportive housing, um, as well as the transition of HIN and COC contracts transitioning over to the KCRHA in Q2 of 2024 instead of Q1 of 2024 as well as the transition of um, Rosie's Village and the um, expansion for that uh, village and movement of that village. We also want to highlight the um, inflation uh, where we are receiving some additional um, COLA this year from the city of Seattle for COC contracts and um, a 2% wage increase for providers. Over the years, we have been trying to diversify our funding with our funders here in the KCRHA. So we wanted to highlight the increase that we're receiving in funds from HUD, Continuum of Care, as well as the Department of Commerce right-of-way and our North King County interlocal agreement to help support um, our uh, full region and North King County to ensure that we're providing supports and resources in that region as well. 
I also want to highlight that we are anticipating to receive an additional or up to rather an additional 2.5 million from philanthropic funds. Um, once those funds are secured, we will share that information with the board and we are anticipating an additional $22.8 million in Department of Commerce funding as well next year. This is our budget broken down by the program type and to show the difference of how our funding is allocated to our different program types, highlighting that our enhanced shelter services is our largest uh, budget uh, budgeted program type. Next would be permanent supportive housing, followed by rapid rehousing. Can you, sorry, Gordon here. Can you hold on this slide for just another 30 seconds or 10 seconds so I can? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just let me know when you're ready. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. As you're well aware, our funding is broken out into three major categories for funders. We have the City of Seattle, King County, and our other funders. This is identifying our funding that we're receiving from the City of Seattle for a total of $113 million, and it's breaking out by the different fund sources that we are receiving those dollars from, as well as the program type that they are being allocated to. This is the same thing for King County, where it's identifying how the $35 million that we receive from King County will be broken out by the particular fund source and the programs that they would be allocated to. And the third category for other fund sources, this is breaking down our funding from our North King County interlocal agreement, philanthropic funding, HUD Continuum of Care, as well as the Department of Commerce right-of-way funding for a total of $75 million. At this point, we would like to highlight our operating budget. It's pretty much level funding from last year to this year with a slight increase from inflation. And we are capturing some of that inflation down in our overhead costs, as well as a decrease in our professional services due to several contracts that we used in 2023 for system rebit planning and development that is no longer needed in 2024, as well as professional, I'm sorry, software where we are shifting our HMIS bit focus contract out of our admin costs and into our program costs due to it being categorized that way by our funders. Again, this is just highlighting our overall 2024 final budget minus the changes that we had identified earlier in the slides and giving you this final overall budget of $224,433,910 for our 2024 budget. At this time, we would like to open up for discussion and questions. Any questions for the team? Oh, Jaja, I see your hand raised. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Tiffany, I think you were pretty thorough there and I just wanted to comment on that. And I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. Thank you, I appreciate that. And it's nice yeah. to see you. Uh, I'm gonna go to Gordon now and then John. Uh, same as my colleague, I thought that was well organized and broken down in ways that I, I, I could absorb. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you for the effort by the team, and Tiffany and the team. I had one specific question. I think you said one of the, the uh, when you looked at the city of Seattle funding, there was um, an increase for inflation and an increase to pay um, providers. Um, and 
if that were to be recurring, would it always happen around the same time period based on the way the city does their budgeting? Um, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, again, just clarification. So, yeah, thanks for the uh, perspective. Awesome. John? Sorry, I was having <clears throat> trouble getting off a of mute there. Thanks. Um, yeah, very good presentation. I appreciate it. I may be missing a little bit in here, but if I'm understanding, it is about a $228 million overall budget of which about 50% of it, 133, maybe a little more than 50% comes from Seattle, King County with another 356 and then 75 million from other sources. I did a quick add of that and I was a little bit off, but basically again, everything that comes from Seattle and comes from King County and much of what is in the other is essentially pre-programmed to certain um, to certain functions and, and certain types of shelter and care. Is, isn't that right? We're essentially implementing what they want us to implement. Uh, yes, more specifically, we rolled over contracts from the city of Seattle and King County in 2022, where we agreed to continue those contracts with those particular providers for those specific projects, whether it's shelter services, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and we are continuing with those contracts year over year until we can move forward with our system rebid. Yeah, so, um... This is a quick question for Helen, maybe, and then back uh, on one more question. Um, when, what is the status on this, on getting to the system rebid? Uh, we will just be engaging in the planning in the beginning in 2024, and it's something we anticipate that the new CEO will need to um, have an opportunity to weigh in on. So would system planning be pushed back most likely a full year? I don't know that it's, Again. I think that decision was made a while ago that it will impact the 2025 contracts. Right, so okay, okay. So it should be ready in time to do 2025 contracts in 2024. That's our intention. The system yeah. rebid, okay. And then finally, um, I found Owen's presentation really interesting, and I'll have to go back and take a look at the numbers, but from that and where we're seeing exits to housing, where we're seeing uh, lower rates of people um, uh, re-entering homelessness, is there any way we will look at that and help guide the requests that we make in 2024 to, uh, it, during 2024, to the county council and the city council uh, that could be guided by that information. It might tell us that some, some types of services are working more if effectively and efficiently than others. I believe that in addition to generally best practices in the arena and taking a look at areas that we know have been challenging. So for example, rapid rehousing dollars are often underspent. So what is it about that program and how can we address that and um, ensure that those investments actually get out into the community and are serving people? Super. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any more questions before we move on to the last thing on our agenda? Awesome. Uh, we will move on to the last thing, which is our 2024 schedule resolution. Uh, we will have to take a formal vote for this, and this will just kind of dictate how we meet as a group uh, coming up in the next year. Um, also, again, like huge kudos to James and Tiffany. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you all for walking us through that. Um, please feel free to look over the materials. You should have got it in your board packet. Again, we will be voting on this come January. Um, all right, and so looking forward to our 2024 resolution. This is resolution 2023-18. Uh, uh, again, there's gonna be some really important dates coming up, including board elections in February. 
Uh, so again, there are four positions that are going to be open. It will be both the, the co-chairs, the treasurer, as well as the secretary. So if you are thinking about running for a position, like please feel free to reach out to any one of us um, or Austin or Helen and just kind of figure out if you feel like this is the right move for you. Um, and then Austin, are we going to go over the resolution or are you just putting it up so people can see it? Happy to go over it. I just put it up so people could see it, but happy to go over it if we would, if you'd like, Chair. Um, yeah, why don't you just do a quick overhaul of it? Yeah, yeah. So the quick overhaul is this is the standard practice for schedules uh, moving forward. As for 2024, um, the dates are below. Um, as uh, as chair as the chair uh, mentioned, uh, February is election month. It also is Valentine's Day. Um, so make sure you pass love this election season. Um, but there are some dates that are off. There's some months that are off that are set for recess, mostly due to slow business. Also to give you all a little break, that is July and December, namely, of next year. So those do not have meetings scheduled in this resolution. Um, the time will be the standard time from two to four on the second Wednesday is how it lies. And uh, the location, of course, will be a uh, hybrid as well. So as an in-person location, like today at University Branch Library, as well as on Zoom. And then, of course, as we know, special meetings can be caught, called by the chair um, within 24 hours of advancement. So, uh, and then this will take effect January 1, 2024. So that is what we'll be voting on. Yeah, and then before I call for the vote, I just want to say, since we are hiring uh, for the new CEO, the likelihood that we will have to call uh, special sessions somewhere, ideally in the first quarter, um, is definitely going to be something that might come up. And we'll work with Austin to kind of get that scheduled as we uh, know more about the timeline. Um, but with that being said, um, do we have a motion to approve 2023-18, resolution 2023-18. I make a motion that we approve 2023-18. Uh, Second. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. nays? Anyone abstain? Awesome. So moved. Um, so Austin, um, we are going to adjourn, but before we do that, um, we just want to take a moment to honor um, John Shomanak for all his years of service, whose term is coming to an end at the end of this year. It is. <laughs> I talked to Claudia about this the other day, um, and uh, I had I had told them that I would stay on for one term. They're going to look into whether or not I can stay on without being reappointed for up to six months. So there's some representation from the county um, and I would be happy to do that. Um, but I definitely um, uh, am looking to, um, uh, to move on from the board. It's, uh, I've enjoyed the work very much and enjoyed the work with the board, um, but definitely want to move on. So I, you may have me to kick around, you may not. I, I'm not 100% certain. Awesome, well, John, uh, we are hoping that we have you around at least for the next six months, but also want to thank you for um, all your time and your advocacy, um, especially in the earlier months when um, getting the Hiring the CEO and getting the KCRHA going was a little bit of a slugger. So thank you uh, so much for that. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Juanita Spotted Elk who um, has decided to step down from the board. Um, Juanita has also fiercely advocated um, both on this board but also locally in her community uh, to support the voices of people with lived experience. Um, Juanita will obviously be very missed um, and we look to uh, new appointees in 2024 to ensure that the board stays filled. Uh, and Jaja, I felt like I saw your hand up, but uh, was, was there something you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to thank John because he is absolutely amazing, you know, a fabulous uh, colleague and uh, 
And I look forward to working with you, continuing for the month or the six months or the 12 months, whatever it turns into. I know you like to move on, but it's been a joy to, uh, to serve with you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, that is all we had. Oh. Is there? Oh, no. sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, just, yeah, I, I can't type fast enough. So I was just saying thank you, John, for your leadership. Hope you do continue to serve with us, especially for the July and August, the, 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 those, those meetings that are occurring during the summer that the rest of us are going to skip that you're going to dutifully. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and, and to uh, what, yeah, you bet, John. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to the future. And Juanita always kept us, us close to um, the hard reality of, of mm -hmm. a life Yep. dealing with homelessness so I, I really appreciated um her commitment um to this rha and to that perspective thanks definitely definitely i i i want to say how much i learned uh from juanita um it was um it was very helpful for me and very helpful to ground me in my approach yeah and, and chair can i just also give uh juanita kudos for just bringing in the indigenous space and and sharing the love and bringing uh, a sense of calmness when there was tension in this meeting you know she uh, has a beautiful heart and speaks from her heart and personal experience and it's uh it's a it's really a lot of information to share for those who have not experienced or walked in the way she walked you know and bringing uh, just just bringing the uh, the indigenous spirit into this space, and it was really she certainly will be missed, but I'm sure she'll pop in in public. Um, you know, <laughs> areas. Yeah, thank you. Well, I also uh, want to take the opportunity to thank everybody on the board. I know this year um, has been hard as we focus on transitions. Um, as we focus on new programs, as the KCRHA focuses on getting back to their book of business, um, looking forward to being with you all, hopefully physically in 2024. Um, but with that being said, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? A motion that we adjourn this meeting. Awesome. A second? Enthusiastically seconded. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Short and sweet. Y'all have a great holiday season. I will see you all in 2024. Happy holidays to everybody. Holidays. Thank you. Happy, Happy holidays. Bye-bye. <laughs>